Software development is a difficult challenge. Programmers use types to make this task more manageable. So what exactly is a type? When you define a variable to store the age of a person, you tell the computer that this variable is a natural number. In fact, if you want to be more precise, you would probably say that it's a natural number between 0 and maybe 150 or so, just to be on the safe side. This tells the computer what to expect, and how much memory to allocate for storing the age value. Whenever you try to assign a value that doesn't comply with the type, the program can throw a helpful error message, so that you know that you made a mistake. In addition, the type also tells the computer about the kinds of operations that are available on the variable. Ages can be added and subtracted, but they cannot be painted in a different color. That operation would only be available for variables of type shape, for example. So, mathematically, a type is just a set of allowed values, plus a list of functions that you can apply to those values. What we're going to do now is construct more complicated types from simpler ones. For each of these constructions, we will also count how many values the new type has. And we will discover some interesting equations between those counts. The first thing we will do is take the product of two types. You may already know this as the Cartesian product of two sets. It contains all of the possible pairs of values from the original sets. So the product of colors and fruits contains everything from green strawberries to purple bananas. In software development, these pairs are often called objects or records. You could model a person as an object with a name and an age. How do you create a person? Just put a name and an age together. That's it. The function that creates an object is called a constructor. It introduces new objects. So it's similar to the introduction rules from the video about logic. What can you do with a pair? Well, basically you can do only two things. You can extract the first value from the pair, or the second one. Extracting the age from a person gives you an integer. And that's why the function goes from the set of persons to the set of integers. So we have three functions in total. A constructor that produces a pair from two values, and then two functions that extract those values again. How many pairs are there? Since the product type contains every possible combination of colors and fruits, it contains 5 times 3, or 15 possible values. Now you see why this type is called the product of the original types. It's because the size is the product of the original sizes. A pear contains a color and a fruit. But it's also very useful to define a type that contains a color or a fruit. This is called the sum type. You can think of it as the union of the two sets. So the resulting set has all the values from both sets. But there is a small catch. What if certain values, such as orange, are present in both sets? We would like to have two different copies of orange here. One as a color and one as a fruit. To avoid this kind of situation, we will give each value a label, or a tag, to indicate which of the two sets it originally came from. This turns our orange value into two different values, the color orange and the fruit orange. The result is known as a tagged union, or a disjoint union. You can now see why it's called the sum type. It has the sum of the number of elements of the original two sets. Sum types are often used when you're writing a piece of software that could potentially fail due to a bug. When you're programming a function that looks up a person's age in a database, you may think that the function returns a natural number. But what if the person doesn't exist? Or what if his or her age is simply not filled in? Well, then you will have to return some error value to indicate that something went wrong. 
In that case, it's useful and very common to define the result type of the function as the tagged union of the natural numbers with the type of error values. That way your function can return a number or an error. Please note that this is very different from returning a pair, which would always contain a number and an error. The next construction we have to talk about is probably the most interesting one. It's called an exponential type. The idea is that you construct all possible functions from one type to another. Let's do a very simple example. Functions that map fruits to true or false. Such a function might, for example, give us the recipe for a fruit salad. The type is a set of functions this time. Note that each of these functions is treated as a value of the new type. This may seem weird at first. We are used to thinking of functions as operating on values. But now we have to jump up one level and treat the entire function itself as a single value. How do you construct a function? By pairing precisely one of the possible output values with each of the input values. Yes, I am using the word pairing here because you can model a function as a set of input-output pairs. What can you do with a function? Well, in computer science lingo we would say that you can invoke or call it, passing a fruit into the function and then it will return its output value to you. In math speak we apply or evaluate the function on its input value, resulting in its output value. How many functions are there? Let's see. We have three pieces of fruit and each of those gets mapped to either true or false. This gives us eight different possible mappings or eight different recipes for fruit salad. That's two to the power of three. In general, the number of values for the function type will be the size of the output type raised to the size of the input type. So now you know why function types are also called exponential types. Counting the number of values in a type doesn't sound like much fun. But it actually reveals lots of interesting tricks for creating cool and useful types. We just need a few more things before we can dive in. First up, we need an empty type. It's a type that has absolutely no values. There's no constructor because there is nothing to construct. Is this type useless? Well, consider that it contains zero values, so we will be able to use it as the neutral element for sums. Zero plus three equals three, right? Translated into types, this means that the tagged union of the fruit type with the empty type is exactly the same as the fruit type itself. The empty type literally doesn't add anything. Okay, I admit that wasn't very impressive. But it inspires us to also define a type with only a single value. This is known as a unit type. Any singleton set will do. So I will just pick a set that contains an abstract little dot. We can use this type as the neutral element for multiplication. Take the product of the fruit type with this unit type. It contains three elements and these are basically still the same as the originals. I mean, technically they are all pairs, but the dot really doesn't make any difference. So one times three is three, and we still have pretty much the same type as before. So the unit type serves as the neutral element for products of types. Thanks to the zero type, we now have a neutral element for sums, which turns types into a monoid. I explain what monoids are and why they always need a neutral element in an earlier video. The one type is the neutral element for the product of types, so this is another way in which types become a monoid. And now that we have these neutral elements, we can start building a kind of algebra of types. a to the b times a to the c can be written more compactly as a to the b plus c. That's just basic algebra, but it also tells us something about types. The first expression is a product, so it counts pairs. 
the factors of the product are exponentials, so they count functions. So we're talking about pairs of functions here. To make this more concrete, let's imagine that one of the functions gives us the color of a piece of fruit, and the other one gives us the color of a vegetable. The equation now tells us that we can represent such a pair of functions as a single function that gives us the color for a fruit or a vegetable. The sum type contains the disjoint union of the three fruits and the four vegetables. So our new function receives either a fruit or a vegetable. It doesn't know in advance what it will get. If we give it a fruit, it will then use the first function from the pair to obtain its color. In case of a vegetable, it uses the other function. So you see that the new function really is equivalent to a pair of functions, one for each type of inputs in the sum. Reasoning about types is more difficult than just doing high school algebra. So these arithmetic expressions can make things easier for us by giving us clues about how to construct interesting new types. The next example is incredibly important. You already know that when you raise a to the b times c, you can also write this as a to the b to the c. We have a lot of exponential expressions here, so we suspect that this is telling us something about functions. Let's look at the expression on the left first. The input type is a product, so it's a set full of pairs. So for example, we might have a function that takes people as inputs. We model each person as having a weight and a height. So a person in this example is a pair of two numbers. We construct it from a given weight and height. The function could then calculate the person's body mass index. When a function like this one takes a pair of values as its input, it's useful to think of it as taking two inputs. So even though we package the weight and height together into a pair, you could think of them as two separate inputs to the function. So we are really talking about a binary function here. It takes two numbers and returns a third. Okay, great, that's easy enough to understand. But what is the expression on the right trying to tell us? Well, it's an exponential, so it's a function from a number, the height, to something else. The output itself is another function from a number, the weight, to the body mass index. So this time we have a function that takes one of the inputs and it produces a new function for us that takes the other input and returns the final BMI value. This two-step process may be a bit confusing the first time you see it, so take your time to make sure you understand what's going on. One important detail is that in the intermediate function, the value of the height has been fixed to a constant. It's no longer an input, it has become a fixed part of the function. The net result is actually pretty cool. Our original function takes two inputs at the same time, packaged in a pair. The new function takes these inputs one at a time. This technique is called currying. It's a well-known idea in computer science, but it also plays a role in other domains of mathematics. For example, we will run into it again when we talk about tensors, because a tensor is a function that takes multiple inputs. So in a future series about tensor algebra, we will see how we can make a tensor take its inputs one at a time. And we will discover that this has important consequences for matrices. If you want to be notified when those future videos become available, don't forget to subscribe. And most of the videos about tensors are already available on Patreon, so you can go and watch them right now if you set up an account. Thank you for supporting our channel. I hope these examples convince you that the algebra of types can lead us to discovering many new tools and tricks. Here's an overview of the kinds of connections we have discovered between types and algebra. We are going to take this even further in the next video. Can you believe that we can describe products, sums, and other types 
without looking at the specific values inside the sets. All of the information about a type is captured in the functions that operate on that type. That is pretty remarkable. So I hope to see you next time when we talk about that in a short video dedicated to category theory.